How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Well, good evening, friends, and welcome to another evening in New York City. And I need to say, with an emphasis, today was an exciting day in the city of New York as New York got together and celebrated a victory with one of their sports teams that have been labeled the winningest team of the century. But tonight, we're going to talk about another team that has never lost, and that's the team that Jesus has in store for all of us. Amen. And we're so glad that you've chosen to be a part of that team that has been set up through the ages, getting ready for all of us to partake in a celebration that will never end. It will last throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. But before we go any further, I'd like you to join with me as we invite God's presence to be with us here in New York and with you around the world. Let us bow. Gracious Father in heaven, what a joy it is to make it through another day and to be given the opportunity of opening your word, the book of life, the bread of life, that has furnished us with strength and insight to lead us from here to the portals of eternity. We pray in a very special way that you'll send your Holy Spirit to be the one that guides our thoughts and our minds, that we will be in one accord wherever we are, in harmony with your spirit and with the word of God. We pray that you'll bless Pastor Bachelor tonight as he seeks to make the message clear. And may all of us be drawn closer to thee because of this time we spend with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, here in Manhattan, those around the world, join with me as we welcome our speaker for this evening, Pastor Doug Bachelor. Thank you, John. Good evening. For those of us here in Manhattan, Feliz Sabado, Happy Sabbath, Dobre Subota, Pong Sabbat for my friends in Panape. That's right here, of course, in New York City. It's Friday night and the Sabbath is beginning, and we wanted to welcome you and welcome it. We have an exciting study tonight talking about how to get a new beginning and be clean. I'd like to bring Mrs. Bachelor out if she could come, and we have so many questions. We understand that. Uh, I think we're entering the uh, double millennium number for the questions that have been coming in for the seminar. Good evening. Over 2,500 something questions that have come in, but really? uh, it's pretty exciting. We won't get to them all tonight. Sorry, friends. <laughs> Our first question is, all right. is there a place called purgatory? And this is from Laura in New York. You know, in our last study, we talked about the Bible truth regarding the punishment of the wicked, a very serious subject. And naturally, someone wonders, well, we've always heard about purgatory. Now, where is that in the Bible? Can someone give me the chapter and verse? Nothing. That's not in the Bible. And uh, the purgatory comes from the, the root word of purge or to purify. It's a doctrine that evolved after the time of Christ and the apostles that the Lord sort of had a purging ground between heaven and hell and your rewards. Uh, it's not a biblical teaching. It uh, crept into the church through some of the Greek and Roman religions. Uh, the Protestants have sort of developed a new version of that called Abraham's bosom. How many of you have heard of Abraham's bosom? It's uh, this idea where souls are supposed to be in a holding pattern until they get their bodies at the resurrection. It's dangerous, I said, to build a whole doctrine on one phrase, especially when the Bible tells us in Luke it's a parable. And so to, to make a uh, true or tangible theology out of a parable, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus that you find in Luke chapter 19. 16. No, Luke 16. Uh, begins with verse 19. It talks about the people in heaven and hell are talking to each other. Friends, do you think the people in heaven and hell will be conversing? It tells that, uh, he says, send him that a drop of water might cool my tongue. Would one drop of water really quench a person's tongue? If everybody that dies goes to Abraham's bosom, 
Can you imagine the size of Abraham's bosom? I mean, obviously, this is a parable with very strong symbols, and I'd like to address it, but there's not time tonight. Okay, it'll be in a lesson. We have a supplement in the back of your lesson dealing with Cities of Ash that talks about that. And I've actually, uh, that's on our Amazing Facts website. We've got uh, an audio answer you can listen to. Okay. Where does the Bible say the new heavens and the new earth will be made of ashes of the wicked, or even from the old earth and heaven? Okay, when God says he makes a new heaven and a new earth, first of all, the new atmosphere is not made of ashes. But if you read in Malachi chapter 4, speaking of the redeemed, it does say they shall go forth, meaning from the new Jerusalem, and tread down the wicked, for they are ashes under the soles of their feet. See, God had an original plan to use this planet as a paradise for his creation. The plan has been interrupted, but God is going to finish what he started. God does not quit. He is the author and finisher of what he does. And he will complete his original plan on this world. Obviously, he needs to clean up and start over. But yes, it's going to be here on earth. Ashes you are, unto ashes you'll return. God made Adam from ashes. He's going to, from the ashes of this purified world, recreate. Did you have a second scripture? You said Malachi 4. Was there another scripture? Well, I just quoted it there in Genesis where it says ashes unto Genesis. ashes. Okay. okay, sorry. Well, they wanted scripture. Let's move on. <laughs> Are there different degrees of punishment for the wicked? Do some suffer longer than others? Well, first of all, doesn't the Bible teach everyone is rewarded according to their works? And we learned the Bible does not teach that everybody burns forever and ever because then everybody gets the same decree. So obviously there's a difference in either duration or intensity. But uh, I, I believe that obviously people who are guilty of more will experience more anguish, whether that's a duration of time or whether intensity. God knows that. The Bible is silent on that point. But there are varying rewards, not only for the wicked. The Bible tells us there are varying rewards for the righteous. And one thing that concerns me is among a lot of people who choose to follow Jesus, they want to know what the minimum requirement is to slide into heaven on the skin of their teeth, so to speak, instead of saying, Lord, how much can I do to please you? They're saying, what do I have to do to squeeze in, to qualify? That's the wrong attitude, right? You should want to do as much as you can for the Lord. Amen. How can one explain the documented cases in which psychics help uh, police to find missing children or criminals? If these are evil spirits using these people as mediums, why would they be helping to fight evil? And this is from Viviana in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. That's a good question. Have you heard before where police supposedly consult psychics to get guidance or information? And I'm sure there are documented cases where they've done this with extraordinary results. We told you when we talked about some of the uh, occult and some of these people who claim to get these visions and messages, they may not be prophets of God. Does the devil know who the criminals are? Of course, they work for him. Does he know what they've done and, and what the uh, evidence is? Can the devil reveal that information to his servants? One of the first things a con artist tries to accomplish is build confidence by giving people an element of truth. And so it should not surprise you that the devil does give some of these psychics elements of truth and reveal things to them so that when he wants to deceive people later, their confidence is built up. That's very obvious to me. All right. Our next question comes from Tanzania. It is written that we should not bow down to worship any graven images, but God told Moses to make a snake of copper. We know that something made in the likeness of God's creation is called a graven image. Why did God allow Moses to make the image for us to look at? Okay, remember we discussed this a little bit. The commandment regarding idolatry does not say, do not make an image, period. It says, do not make an image and bow down to it and serve it and worship it. When Moses was commanded by the Lord, first of all, you realize there were images of angels and pomegranates and there were oxen in the temple of God under God's instruction. They weren't to pray to the oxen or the pomegranates or the angels. You've got photographs, many of you, in your purses and wallets. And if you're a grandmother, you probably worship it, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about. Having an image is a replica or a facsimile of something. It's not a sin. You're not to pray to these things. When Moses was told to make the bronze serpent, they were to look at that in faith that the serpent would be, it was to be repulsive to them. 
The serpents is what was killing them. It was a sign that the serpent would be defeated. When you kill a snake, you pick it up with a stick. You don't pick it up with your hand. That's why when God told Moses to take the serpent by the tail, you don't ever do that. You grab it behind the neck if you're going to grab the serpent. And so you pick it up with a stick. That was a symbol that the serpent would be defeated. They weren't worshiping the serpent. Turn in your Bibles. Let me prove that. I, I got a scripture here for you. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4. When Hezekiah became king, they still had the bronze serpent. Now the people had made a god out of it. Hezekiah removed, verse 4. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4. He removed the high places, broke down the images, cut down the groves, and broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For in those days the children of Israel burnt incense to it. And call, he called it Neheshten, meaning piece of brass. They had started worshiping it. He ground it to powder. See, when Moses was first commanded, it was to be a sign of a defeated serpent, not to be worshiped. It was to be repulsive. Okay. This question comes from Ben in Fairfield, California. Do we know what the age of accountability is? And, you know, this also ties in with our lesson tonight where we talk about baptism and a new birth. At what age is the age of accountability? It's not specified specifically in the Bible. Uh, Jesus, at 12 years of age, went to the temple. Uh, somewhere between the time of Christ and the modern times, I know my Jewish family and friends I grew up with, they get bas mitzvah or bar mitzvah at 13 years of age. Back in the time of Christ, it was 12. You know, I think the Lord looks on a person's heart to know when they're comprehending the claims of the gospel. And it varies from person to person. Uh, girls seem to mature spiritually a little sooner than boys. That's a fact. Um, I don't like to admit. But it, it, is a, it is a fact. And so the age of accountability may vary. Now, what about people who maybe have some sort of mental handicap that are like little children all their lives? Obviously, God is going to judge them as little children who never matured. You know what I'm saying? God is a just God. So you need to ask for the guidance of the parents if you're talking about baptism. There's no specific age given. The ballpark would be 12, maybe a little before, a little after. Okay. What will be the end result for someone who commits suicide? Will the result be the same if that person is a believer? Well, and my, they're referring to Romans 8, 38, verses 38 and 39, where well, nothing can separate me from, from the love of God. Life. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I would question why a believer would commit suicide because in most cases, now you notice I'm being very careful. We all know somebody who's made that tragic mistake. In most cases, suicide is the fruit of someone who is in a faithless, hopeless condition. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. But there are exceptions. I did a funeral. Young lady, very discouraged. She may have been going through some problems where there were some mental problems or chemical problems. Only God knows. Took some pills to kill herself and then afterward regretted it, called for help, tried to get the ambulance and people to come in time. They could not revive her. She died. She technically on her birth certificate is a suicide. Her, her death certificate. Her, her death certificate, thank you, is a suicide. But, um, I, you know, who knows what went through her mind between the time she committed the act and she actually died. She may have repented. When you think about it, Samson, who will be in the kingdom, was a suicide. Mm -hmm. He said, let me die with the Philistines. But what he did is he sacrificed his life to deliver God's people from their enemies. But he pushed the building down. He knew it was going to kill him. So there you've got a case of someone who's technically a suicide who will be saved. But in most cases, and if anyone out there is thinking of this as an option, <laughs> it's a terrible mistake. You know, people think of suicide because they're hurting. Mm -hmm. For most suicides, you're not going to usher yourself into a better existence, but you're permanently going to seal a bad situation. The Bible says where there's life, there's hope. Solomon said a living dog is better than a dead lion. Amen. And so hang in there. Don't give up. Amen. Okay. Our last question comes from Rachel in Poolsbo, Washington. Where did the dinosaurs come from? Were they created by God? I remember uh, growing up there across the street from the Museum of Natural History. I wanted to be a paleontologist, and I was enthralled with the dinosaurs. I believe they existed. 
I believe that Noah, according to the command of God, took two of each creature on the ark. And people say, how could he fit a brontosaurus and a tyrannosaurus rex and a triceratops and a stegosaurus on the ark? He didn't have to take a full-grown one. He could have taken a nitty-bitty one. He could have taken an egg, right? But I believe that after the flood, the larger reptiles that maybe were a threat to man were exterminated. The, the people that lived back then, the Bible says Nimrod was a mighty hunter. They rendered them extinct. Not only are many of these great reptiles extinct, but, you know, there's a lot of other animals that are now extinct. I take issue with the people who use these dating methods. I believe the carbon-14 radioisotope dating is a terribly flawed technique, and the whole evolutionary theory stands or falls on their dating methods. I want to welcome again our friends who are studying God's Word with us across the world, across the country. Tonight our lesson is dealing with a river of life. And we're going to be talking about the subject of how to get a new beginning, how to be clean. But we're starting, of course, with an amazing fact. The highest mountain in the world is Mount Everest, 29,028 feet, uh, give or take a few inches. They're as close as they can measure it. The deepest ocean in the world is the Marianas Trench, 35,813 feet, which means in theory you could take the Mount Everest, cut it off at sea level, place it in the deepest ocean, and you'd still have approximately a mile of water covering it. That's a deep sea out there. Now why is that important? The Bible says if you have faith, you can say into this mountain, be plucked up and be cast into the sea and it will be done for you. And then the Bible tells us that our sins are cast into the depths of the sea. So the good news is it doesn't matter how big your mountain of sin might be, God's ocean of grace is deep enough to cover the whole thing, and then he plants a no fishing sign. Amen? Amen. So that's a good, amazing fact. The deepest ocean is higher than the highest mountain. Tonight's lesson is dealing with a river of life. And it comes to us in our historical from 2 Kings chapter 5. It's a story of Naaman. Now, Naaman was a mighty general who worked for the Syrian king. The Bible has only good things to say about him to a point. It tells us that he was a brave man, an honorable man, a man that the Lord could use. He was used by God in valor. He was a, a courageous man, probably worked his way up through the ranks as a soldier, and his exploits in battle gave him a reputation where as he went down the streets of Damascus, everybody recognized Naaman. But uh, something happened. He was rich, he was famous, but the Bible tells us in those five words that end the first verse, but he was a leper. You know, disease sometimes is indiscriminate, and he came down with that dreaded incurable disease of leprosy. Now, just to give you the picture, in Bible times, a leper was isolated from those who were clean, could not embrace his wife or hug his children. As he walked down the streets of Damascus, he had to cry unclean. People no longer wanted to gather around and hear his stories. It was a disease that caused separation. You know, leprosy in the Bible is a type of sin. Sin separates. Isaiah says, your sins have separated you from God. Sin will separate you from God. Sin will separate you from each other. And sin will separate you from you. Some people don't even like themselves. When you give your heart to the Lord, you love the Lord, you love your neighbor, you love yourself. Amen. Sin works the opposite. It's a disease. It's a deadly disease. Well, the Bible goes on and tells us something remarkable happened. Evidently, the Syrians had gone out on one of their raids, and they'd captured a young Israelite girl, and she served Naaman's wife. And instead of being angry that she'd been carried away to be a slave in the, this uh, foreign kingdom, Syria and Israel were often at battle with each other. When Naaman came down with leprosy, this young girl could have thought, well, good, I hope he rots. But she maybe read the story of Joseph, and she said, you know, if I'm going to be a servant, I'm going to be a good servant. And she gave a message of hope to Naaman's wife. She said, only if my master was with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Now, who's going to believe the message from a little servant girl? When you're desperate, you're ready to accept just about anything. And so, Naaman 
pretty soon word reached the king and he made provisions. And he took his escort and a great deal of money to pay for his healing. Took about half a million dollars in gold and silver and clothing. That's about like medical bills today. <laughs> to go to the prophet. Now the prophet was Elisha. Elisha had never healed anybody before. Incidentally, Jesus' name in Hebrew is Yahshua. It means Je Jehovah is Savior. Elisha's name is Elohim Shua. It means God is Savior. It's a very similar name. Interesting thing about Elisha, he had a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Nobody ever came to Elisha with a problem that was turned away. He worked a miracle for everybody in need, whether the water tasted bad or their borrowed tools were missing. And that's how Jesus is. He cares about all of our needs, doesn't he? Amen. Well, pretty soon, Naaman made his way to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel had a fit. He said, why are you coming to me? Am I... Supposed to be a miracle cure? Well, the little girl did not say, go to the king of Israel. She said, go to the prophet. And the king of Israel thought that the king of Syria was trying to incite a war, and he ripped his clothes, and it was in the headlines the next day, king tears clothes. And pretty soon word reached Elisha that Naaman had come seeking healing. And Elisha the prophet sent a message to the king of Israel. He said, let him come to me, and he will know there is a prophet in Israel. Sometimes people forget that God's alive. We go to the government instead of going to God with our problems. And Naaman made his way to the house of Elisha, and Elisha doesn't even come out to see him. He sends a servant. You know, Jesus often sends messengers instead of speaking to us directly. And the servant says, go wash in the Jordan River seven times and your flesh will be restored. Evidently, his leprosy had advanced to the place where he maybe was even missing some of his extremities. Your flesh will be restored. He was in pretty bad shape. And you'll be clean. Have you ever felt dirty and longed to be clean? You know, I came back from India, and I'll tell you, it's really sad. They still have lepers there that uh, they're missing their toes or their fingers, and they live in the streets, and the streets are very dirty. And, and that's the picture I've got in my mind. Well, Naaman was insulted. First of all, he's insulted that he's got to listen to the message of this little slave girl. Then he's turned away by the king of Israel. Then he comes to see Elisha the prophet, and he's used to dealing in palaces with the dignitaries, and he doesn't even honor him with a personal visit. He sends out his servant. Then he says, go wash. Now, what's implied when someone says, go wash? Amen. You're dirty. The Jordan River was not that clean. It was sort of a brownish-green color. And when you're told to wash seven times, what's implied there? Amen. When you're told to wash seven times in a dirty river, what's implied? And that was more than he could stand. And he spun his chariot around in a rage and he stormed off and he shouting at the top of his lungs, can't I go back to Damascus and wash in the rivers of Abana and Parfar? Aren't they much cleaner than all the waters of Israel? And he was right. The rivers in Damascus were cleaner than the Jordan, but God said the Jordan. Does God mean what he says? God is specific, but God is merciful. And on his way back to Damascus, he had to go by the Jordan River. You can be lost if you want to, but God is going to make it difficult for you. If you want to be lost, you've got that freedom, but you're going to have to march over the broken body of Jesus on your way to destruction. He and the cross stand in your way as an obstacle. And when he came to the Jordan River, as he was going by, his servants came to him. This, you see, they drew near. He had leprosy. They had to keep a distance, and now they're taking risk, and they draw near. And they say, Master... If he had told you to go fight a battle or climb a mountain or do some great deed, you would have done it. He says, wash and be clean. You're right here. What have you got to lose? First, he gets a message from a little girl, then from the servant of Elisha, now from his own servants. You know, sometimes it's not any one message that reaches us, but a series of things that happen over the course of our life. A lot, uh, Naaman thought that his problem was leprosy. His problem was pride. Good man, but he was a proud man. And he had to get all these messages from these humble sources. And now he had to get off his high horse, take off his glittering armor, there with everybody watching, sort of humiliating to see all your leprosy, walk down in the muddy waters of the Jordan, brushing aside the scum on the surface. And he dips himself down once, and he comes up. He's still got his spots, still has his leprosy. Twice. He says, what's the use? I'm not going to be any cleaner the third time than I was the second or the fourth. Why not get out? It's not working. What did God say? How many times? When God says something, does he mean it? 
When God said to Joshua, march around the city seven times and you'll get the victory, the walls will fall and you'll be blessed, it did not happen after six times. They marched around on the seventh day seven times, they blew the trumpet, and then God worked his power. When God says that he's blessed the seventh day, he means the seventh day. God is specific, and a lot of people miss the power and blessing that God has for them because they think it doesn't matter. They want to do it their way. But Naaman, probably ready to quit, and his servant said, look, you've gone this far. Just do it seven times. And he complied. He thought, what have I got to lose? I'm going to go home and die. And he dipped down again three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times, and he came up the seventh time. The spots were gone. You, he, he must have felt something. Must have felt his flesh popping back into position and fingers popping and toes popping back where they belong. I don't know, but he must have felt something. And he was happy. The Bible says that his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. That always cracks me up. You picture this brave, fearless general with baby skin. <laughs> Soldier said, boy, you're healed. Can I touch? You know, and that's what a Christian is. A Christian is a soldier who is a child of God, except you become converted and become like little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, this is the story of how to be healed from the leprosy of sin in the Jordan River. And the Jordan in the Bible is a symbol of death, burial, and resurrection. Children of Israel had to cross the Jordan to get into the promised land. And the Jordan is a symbol of baptism. Let's go now to question number one. What New Testament prophet used the Jordan River for baptizing and cleansing? It tells us, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and then went out to him all Jerusalem and all Judea and the region round about Jordan and they were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Jesus calls John the Baptist the greatest of the prophets. Why do you think he said that? Well, several reasons. One is John was the one who actually introduced Christ to the world. He sort of uh, announced the Lord. He was the bridegroom. He was a humble man. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. And furthermore, John had the privilege of helping people experience the commitment to Christ. John, you might say, was the minister who married people to Jesus through baptism. That's what it's all about. It's a commitment to Christ. Number two, what glorious Bible ceremony symbolizes a washing away from the leprosy of sin? You can read it here in your lesson. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. It says, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, you notice it says that baptism is connected with washing away sin. Does the water wash away sin? Can H2O wash away our sins? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But your faith in Christ is shown through your acting out baptism, just like you are saved by virtue of your faith in Christ's sacrifice. Maybe you did not see it, but you are saved by faith in that. And when you follow Christ in baptism, you do experience a cleansing that you will feel by faith. Question number three. According to the Bible, how many different kinds of baptism are acceptable. Ephesians chapter 5 says there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Now, I believe that means there's one truth we are baptized into, and there's one Lord, but biblically there's one method of baptism that's seen, only one throughout the Bible, and we're going to look at uh, the evidence for that. A lot of different things are done these days that are called baptism. Question number four, what does the word baptize mean? Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. To understand something about the biblical method of baptism, all you have to do is look at the word. The word baptizo is the word that's often used. It means to dip, immerse, to plunge underwater. It means to complete, completely submerge. It's a word that's found in ancient Greek texts when they would uh, dye cloth. They would baptizo the cloth. They would immerse it, plunge it under. And that's what the word means because the symbol is very important. Some people say, well, it's just a ceremony, whether you're sprinkled or whether you're poured. You know, one reason we're addressing this is because there are so many different religions in the world today that are saying, because it's a symbol, 
the manner of baptism doesn't really matter. I respectfully disagree. I think when God establishes these sacred ceremonies, the symbols are very important. Amen. You know, we have in the Christian church a ceremony. It comes from the Passover service of the unleavened bread, which is a type of the body of Christ, and that unfermented grape juice, which is a type of the pure blood of Christ. And I heard one pastor say, well, obviously it's not the literal body and the literal blood. So, you know, since it's a symbol, as long as you believe, let's use hamburgers and Coca-Cola. That's blasphemous. And people, the sacred service of marriage. Why does a bride typically wear white for the wedding? What does it symbolize? See, you know, these things have meaning. Now, my mom, on her last wedding, she was married four times, she wore scarlet. She understood the symbols. My mom was sort of a renegade. But people now with weddings, you know, they're, people are jumping out of airplanes and getting married, take, doing their vows as they plummet towards the ground before they open their parachutes. And other people are getting married while they scuba dive or they go off a waterfall in a kayak. And, you know, it, you lose the sacredness of the service when uh, you do this. So the symbol and maintaining the exact technique that God designed does have an importance to it because a lot of beauty is lost when we neglect that. Question number five. Jesus is our example. How was he baptized? Now, we want to follow Christ's example. Am I right? Mark chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. The Bible says, Jesus came and was baptized of John in the Jordan and straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open. The Bible tells us Christ came up out of the water. Now, why was Jesus baptized? To wash away his sin? There are three principal reasons that Christ was baptized. Number one, the Bible says he's given us an example that we should walk as he walked. So he was baptized as an example for us to follow. The second reason Christ was baptized is so that we might expect what he experienced. Christ, when he was baptized, began a life of ministry. When a person marries Christ through baptism, they then too become a servant of the Lord and begin working for the Lord. Furthermore, they hear God say, you are my son. They're adopted into the family. God said to Jesus, I'm well pleased with you. He becomes well pleased with us. The Spirit came. God gives you the Spirit because you cannot live the Christian life without the Christian Spirit. So we are told to expect what Christ experienced. Second reason. Third reason. Now this may be new for some of you. Christ was baptized also in behalf of those who cannot be. Now, what about the thief on the cross? Jesus said, Verily I say to you today, you'll be with me in paradise. We learned about that. He's not there yet, but he's going to be in paradise. Was he baptized? We have no evidence that he was. Does that mean he couldn't be saved? The Bible tells us baptism is very important. We get credit for Christ's perfect life by faith. He will give credit to those who cannot be baptized by faith for his baptism. He wasn't baptized for his sins, was he? So we can claim by faith his baptism if we cannot be baptized. Like Pastor Doug sometimes goes to the hospital. I'll visit people who come to the Lord in the 11th hour of their life. It doesn't happen often, but it does occasionally occur. They're hooked up to all these machines and this plumbing and wires, and they can't be baptized because of their sickness. Is that going to be an obstacle to their salvation? Or will Jesus give them credit for his baptism? Sometimes I go to prisons. There's a person on death row, and the prison will not accommodate a baptism because of security problems. That person can still be saved by faith if they genuinely repent. Christ will give them credit for his baptism. Now, there's more I want you to notice about baptism. The Bible tells us, I've got some additional scriptures. Now, John, the Baptist, was also baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there, and they came there and they were baptized. The Bible says he needed much water. You know, in the summertime, the Jordan River is sometimes a series of stagnating pools. You've got to find a place where the water is deep enough. If sprinkling and pouring and these other methods are the biblical technique of baptism, John did not need a river. He could have used a canteen in the desert, right? He could have used a spring or a well up in Jerusalem. He needed a large body of water because people were buried. They were immersed. When the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The Bible tells us that they were baptized in the sea. Baptism is the place where we leave Egypt and we begin our journey to the promised land, right? We leave the devil's territory. It marks a transformation.
transition point from being freed from slavery and beginning a new direction for your life. Well, they, God could have made the children of Israel walk on water. Is that right? But he said, no, I want you below water level. He, he, they baptized them in the sea. And then he baptized them in the cloud, the spirit. And you must be born of the water and the spirit. And I'm getting it myself. Number six, how did Philip, let's look at some Bible examples here. How did Philip baptize the treasurer from Ethiopia? You can find this in Acts chapter 8, verse um, 38 and 39. It says that
They went down both into the water, both Philip and and he baptized him. And then it goes on to say, when they had come up. I'm going to go quickly through the things a person needs to know. First of all, answer A, they must understand the teachings of Jesus. They need to be taught and they need to understand the like new birth. <laughs> Before the sun went down that day, I was in jail. <laughs> witnessing to the other people in the cell with me about my baptism that morning. You know, there, there's, you need to be taught about what the commitment means. Number 18. When Jesus was baptized, what did his father say? Mark 1, 9 and 11. And it came to pass in those days when Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, I want to read something to you real quick. What can we expect at baptism? What happened to Jesus is what we should expect. Notice what it says here. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and verse 17. It tells us the heavens were open. When you're baptized, the heavens are open. We are denied access except through Christ when we commit our lives to him. Then it says he saw. Your vision is enhanced. Otherwise, it's the blind leading the blind. The Spirit of God comes into your life. You can't live the Christian life without the Christian spirit. You can't fight the devil in the wilderness without the spirit of God. It came like a dove. God will give you peace. So many people are living in fear. Would you like that peace that passes understanding? Then you hear a voice. You will hear God speaking to you, a still small voice guiding you. Amen? Saying, this is my beloved son. You are adopted into the family. You become a child of God. And then he says, in whom I am well pleased. No matter how bad your sins have been, no matter how much you've disappointed the Lord, no matter how filthy you've been, no matter how deep your leprosy, you can be clean in the blood of the Lamb. Do you believe that, friends? All that Christ experiences is an example of what God wants you to experience. The power, the joy, the peace, the access to heaven. It can be yours when you make a commitment to invite the Lord into your life. You need to be taught first. I'm going to invite you who are watching and you who are here to pray about your decision. Many of you have never been baptized or maybe you've not been baptized biblically or you've not been baptized into the truth. Jesus is the truth that will set you free. Tonight I'd like to ask you, would you like to begin preparing for the sacred rite of baptism so God can say to you, Thou art my beloved son, my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Please indicate on your envelope. Don't forget your prayer requests on the back. We also do appreciate your offerings. You know, there was a man, the Bible tells us, who was full of leprosy. Had to go everywhere saying, unclean, unclean. And he approached Jesus. The crowd probably shouted him back and threw stones at him, but Christ did not shrink away. The man was covered with filthy rags, and that's how we come. His disease was obvious. Even Luke, the physician, says, full of leprosy. But he said, Lord, if thou wilt, you can make me clean. He came in faith. And Jesus not only said, I will, it says he reached out and touched him. And he said, be thou clean. You know, when God says be, something happens. He said, let there be light. And that's how it all happened, right? And when God says, be clean, he was clean. God can make you clean, friends. Doesn't matter how far you wandered or what your sins were. That's the whole purpose for this seminar. You can understand the prophecies. You can understand the future. But we want you to know the Lord. He is the one. He is the truth that is going to set you free. Please stand with me if you'd like to accept that truth. Please pray with your local groups as we close here in Manhattan. Thank you.